coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. We have arrived at a place in the Gentile church in America where we have allowed ourselves to think more highly of ourselves than we should. Instead of loving God more than self, as a nation of people, we have forgotten what the Father and Jesus have done for us. It's not my job to convict y'all. It's my job to, to preach, and then the Holy Spirit will do the convicting. We have forgotten what the Father and Jesus have done for us for the most part. We can tell that by the way we're living. Be ye holy as I am holy, God says. Consequently, we aren't as grateful to the Lord or honoring to the Lord or His Word as we once were in this nation when we first came to faith in Jesus Christ. Instead of presenting ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service, we have allowed the world by and large to influence us as Christians so that now we have turned our hearts away from the Lord and His commandments. I'm going to bunch all of us up inside of this because even if we had the sin of omission and not actually the sin of commission, not doing something that you know to do is still called I'm so glad you were able to join us today on Keys to Kingdom Living. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Dockery, coming to you from the World Harvest North Sanctuary. Today we're bringing you a very exciting message. Literally, as the message was going forth, you could feel the power and the presence of God, and I know it will be the same today where you're watching. Get out the Word of God, go with me, and let's hear the first segment of There is a Choice to be Made. In verse 6, therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe, he, Jesus, is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You know, what I love about God is it doesn't matter who accepts him, who rejects him, who allows him to work through them or does not allow him to work through them, he still gets it done. Just because the ones that Jesus was sent to rejected him did not stop him from saving the world, did it? Therefore, to you who believe, verse 7, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They don't want to hear the truth, in other words. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. That's so sad right there, isn't it? They were appointed to the word of, that brings salvation, but they were disobedient. But you, you who have accepted Jesus, you who love the truth, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Religion didn't save you. You woke up one morning and God said, today I'm going to save you. Today you're going to hear my voice and my voice is going to call you. You may have even tried to run, but my voice, when it calls you, you can't outrun my voice. David said, where can I go from your presence? If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I ascend into the heavens, you're there. So when he calls, you got to answer. Or you can be like Jonah, spend a few days in, uh, I don't know, a whale. Who, were, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Then after Peter writes that, by the Spirit of God, he says this, Blood, that's all, all of us that are in Christ, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against your soul. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, the word Gentiles there also is uh, heathen, the lost, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, the way you respond to him, them righteously, will 
uh, which they observe will glorify God in the day of visitation. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the fire of God that's on my life to preach this word. But I'm asking you, let your spirit come upon your people, that they will have ears to hear, hearts to receive, and eyes to see what you're hearing, say, what you're saying to them, what you're telling them and showing them, that they may receive it. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. If you are a Gentile who has been born again by the Spirit of God because you placed your eternal trust in Jesus as Savior, you are blessed beyond human comprehension. I cannot overemphasize that statement, how blessed we Gentiles are to be able to partake of the salvation that was originally intended for the Jews. The covenant that God made with Abraham was to establish the Jews as God's chosen people that God might demonstrate his love, his favor, and salvation through them to the world. The Jews were, I mean, the Gentiles were not a part of that covenant. However, everything changed for Gentiles when, G, when Jesus gave himself on the cross of Calvary because John tells us in his gospel that God so loved the the world, not just the Jews, not just the Gentiles. He loves the entire world that he gave his one and only son for the sin of all people. God's not willing that any should perish, but all of us come to repentance. Whenever the Jews rejected Jesus and his teachings, God opened the door for Gentiles to be given the opportunity to become children of God and recipients of the benefits of God's covenant that he made with both with the covenants that he made with Abraham and with Jesus. When you are in Christ Jesus and you have the faith of Abraham, you are the children of Abraham, even if you're a Gentile. Amen? Amen. That means we're recipients of that covenant and the new covenant in Christ Jesus. We're blessed physically and spiritually. Now, we Gentiles have the same privileges offered to us that were originally intended solely for the Jewish people. That's why, as Gentiles, we are really blessed. We, too, have been called out of darkness and into the marvelous light of the gospel of peace. We who were not a people are now the people of God, the Bible says. That's shouting ground right there. I didn't belong to anyone. I didn't belong to God. I was an orphan in this world, but God called me out, and he named me with his name, bought me with his blood. Now I am a child of God. You are a child of God if Jesus is your Savior and Lord, and you are God's people. We who have accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord have become a chosen generation. We've lost sight of that, I believe, in the church in America, that we are a chosen generation. We're not the tail. We're the head. We're above, not beneath. We're the first, not the last. We need to get our identity back and stay away from the world. They're not our identity. Don't listen to them. Listen to what God said. He's the manufacturer. He knows you from the inside out. We're not only a chosen generation, we're a royal priesthood. I like that. He calls us kings and priests in Christ Jesus. We got royal blood in us. We're royalty. We're a royal priesthood. We, we, mm. Here's the tough one. Brace yourself. A holy nation. Didn't say a holy dom denomination. He took the demon out. It's holy nation. A peculiar or a purchased people unto God. Yes, we're different. God made us different. He put something different in us that's different than anything in the world. Therefore, we stick out, we stand out, and we should stand up for what stands out instead of hiding it. It is our responsibility, according to what Peter says, to bring glory and honor to the Lord for all that he has done on our behalf as Gentiles. However, just as the Jews have been despised, hated, killed, and rejected by the Gentiles throughout their history, Christians are now hated, persecuted, killed, and rejected by those who are of the world. If God calls you, if God elects you, then everybody else is going to hate you. 
Although we are hated for Christ's sake, we must continually remind ourselves of all that Jesus has done for us that we should be called the children of God. Satan likes to jump on top of us, beat us up, and while he's beating us up, he tries to beat us down. You'll get that. Because if you ever get beat up on, you start feeling low about yourself. So he beats us down, but we've got to remind ourselves. we got to do like David did when he came back from Zitlag, and the, the, the families were gone, and everything was burnt down to the ground. And, and he went and said, I'm going to go encourage myself in the Lord. That's what we've got to do in this day and time. We've got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. God has not forsaken us. Satan is just trying to jump on us, trying to discourage us, trying to disappoint us, and make us think that God has forsaken us. But if we'll encourage our ourselves in the Lord. Before you know it, we start getting breakthrough in our own lives because oppression can come upon you and, and cloud out the day of, of Christ so that you, you all you see is darkness. That is nothing but spiritual oppression and, and depression. And if you rebuke it, it's got to go. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And when you encourage yourself in the Lord as David did, you start hearing from God. God says, if you'll pursue these idiots that came and destroyed everything and took your families, I promise you, you will uh, catch up with them. You will overtake them, and without fail, you will recover all. God says there's restoration in your lives if you'll stick it out with God. God will bring restoration. Yeah, the enemy came in to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah, he wreaked havoc in your home like he did in Job's home, but God is a God of restoration to those who will hold on until Christ can bring in the restoration. Don't give up on God. God is coming through for you. Don't give up on God. We got to remind ourselves who we are. The world ain't going to tell you who you are. They'll tell you who they think you are. I don't know why we listen to them. As God's special children, we're commanded in Scripture to abstain from less flesh. I knew I'd mess that up. Stay away from lust. <laughs> when you're in North Georgia, talk like North Georgians. Stay away from it. It's kryptonite because fleshly lust war against our souls. What does that mean? If you set your heart desires on the pleasures of sin and, and on the world, you will lose your peace. As a Christian, you will lose your peace if you set your, because, you know, you, you get you a brand new car. And after you get you a new car, you start worrying about the payments. Then you worry about somebody throwing a buggy inside the side of the door. So you park at the end of the parking lot, and you park all the way down there and walk all the way up to the store. When you come out, there's eight cars parked all, and one of them's right next to you. You look, and there's a ding. And then you lose your religion. I don't understand. I just let that go. So if we set our heart's desires on the pleasures of sin and on the pleasures of this world, we will lose our, our peace. But more than that, we'll have no strength to overcome self. Jesus told the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, I want you to pray with me for one hour. That's all I ask, 60 minutes. Give me 60 minutes of your time in prayer, and you'll overcome temptation. And you know what they couldn't overcome? Self. Because they had their hearts on the things of the world at that time. And they had no strength to overcome self so that they could please God. So what happened to them? Every one of them entered into temptation and denied Christ. Now, just as we Gentiles have been given great favor from God because we have accepted Jesus as his son, we have an even greater responsibility to keep our hearts pure. Yes. We've got to keep our hearts pure, church, so that we do not tempt the Lord who has saved us. This is why I start losing people. Abstain from fleshly lust. Set your mind on things above 
and put to death, mortified the deeds of the flesh on earth. Read Colossians chapter 3. It tells you what you got to mortify, what you got to put to death so that you can please the Father. Now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10. Lay a little foundation here. Bless you. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, speaking of the Jews that came out of Egypt. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The Red Sea was literally a baptismal for the Jews, but a grave for the Gentiles. What saves the righteous destroys the wicked. <laughs> you know why? Do you know why? Faith overcomes this world. Makes us righteous. So God delivers the righteous, but what destroys us is sin, so God has to destroy sin. So whatever has sin in it gets destroyed. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in, in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. Now he's talking to us Gentiles about what the Jews did wrong that did not please God, and as a result, they paid the price. To the intent that we should not lust, that's what Peter just said, abstain from fleshly lust. Now Paul is saying that these things were our, given to us as examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things that, are, that they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up and to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ. Hmm. See, when we go after the things of this world, we're tempting the Lord who has saved us. As some of them also were tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain or murmur as some of them who also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things, say all these things. All these things happened to them, the Jews, as examples. And they were written for our, the Gentiles, admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So what are we learning from the Jews? Not much. We're doing pretty much the same thing they did. Even though the Jews were God's chosen people, we see what the Lord allowed to happen to them when they chose to harden their hearts to his commandments and to live the way they desired. That's happening now in Christendom, is it not? People are forsaking God's ways and wanting to live life on their terms. If they, the Jews, were God's very special people and they were cut off, who are we as Gentiles to think that God won't cut us off if we disobey his will for our lives and live in sin? Paul teaches that. Read your Bible. Don't boast against the, the root. We ought to hold ourselves as Christians, as Gentile Christians, we ought to hold ourselves accountable to the Lord to live holy because He is holy and because of His great love for us that He saved us even though we were not originally a part of God's plan and we were not Jews. That's good shouting ground right there. He accepted me when I wasn't even supposed to be accepted. And it is only because of the rejection of the Jews toward Jesus that they rejected him that I even got a chance, that you even got a chance as a Gentile. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So let's get to the crux of the problem for us Gentiles. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, what? Holy, acceptable unto who? 
unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the least you can do. And do not be conformed to this world, church. So many are being conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by getting the Word of God inside of you, that you may prove what is that good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one of us the measure of faith. It's about faith. Let's shift gears for a moment. Go okay? We live in the greatest nation in the world as Americans, in my opinion. There are people that have left their homelands to come to this country who have lost their lives along the way while seeking political asylum, refuge, a new beginning, and a better life for themselves and their families. We, we hear about that in the news. There are those who have uh, successfully arrived here in this nation and become citizens of America who become well off, established business people, entrepreneurs, right? Head of conglomerates and corporations and businesses, and they've done very well, and they've raised up generation after generation because they adopted the principles of America, and they're blessed beyond imagination that they never would have gotten or been able to acquire in their homelands. However, we have also witnessed as many have come to America and have tried to transform this nation from what it has been into something far less. There are those who have, please don't let this anger you, I'm trying to bring out a point, okay? There are those who have come here with evil in their hearts and have destroyed lives and caused chaos and destruction on our own shores. And we have witnessed that in the name of religion sometimes. What happens, though, to the gratitude of people who have been given the privilege to leave places of abject poverty, disease, and in many cases, dictators who made life miserable for them to, to come to America and thrive as citizens? What happened to the gratitude of many of those that have been given this great blessing called America to become citizens of America? After a while, People get so used to the blessings, they start complaining about what they don't have. Well, this ain't like we had it over in Egypt. I'd like to have some leeks and onions up here on my pizza, God, but you don't want, all you want to do is give me dough for the pizza. I don't have any leeks and onions. Oh, that we would be back in Egypt. I tell you why. Why won't we just bring Egypt into America? That's what they try to do. They try to transform America to make it what they came from, not realizing that they fled, but the, the, the selfish nature of man will cause us to make a cesspool out of the place we're in that God has given us after delivering us from the cesspool that he brought us up out of. Amen or oh me. As Gentiles who are also called Christians, we must guard our hearts lest we should allow pride and rebellion to fill our hearts to where we start thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to the point that we forget to be grateful to, to the Lord for all that he has done for us Although we're almost out of time today, there is so much in store for you in the second part of this message. There is a choice to be made. Perhaps you've never heard the things that are being taught in this message or will hear in the conclusion of this message about after we've accepted Christ, we then have to lay self down and then follow his instructions, not our earthly or fleshly lust. That is exactly what God is saying in this message. We've got to let self go because self will tell us God is not enough. His blessings are not enough. Salvation is not enough. You need to do this. You need to add that. You need to work harder. You need to be this or you need to be that. And it, always pulling you down. In Christ, we are complete. Paul tells us that in his epistles. And that gives us peace. That gives us strength. 
it gives us confidence in Christ that he has made us complete and we don't have to be anything except available to the Holy Spirit to work through us. If you have enjoyed this message and you would love to hear it in its entirety, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can go to our website, whcnorth.org. There you can go to the audio podcast, click on it, pull up the title. There is a choice to be made. Listen to it in its entirety right there on the website or two. At the top of our website on the home page, you can click download the app. That is our church app that can connect you with this ministry, Keys to Kingdom Living and War Harvest Church North 24-7. We upload new ministry materials such as this message every week so that you can feed your faith and overcome this world. Download that app. Stay connected with us. And let us link arms so that you can walk in the power of God's might through his spirit, his anointing, and his word and live in victory. And for those that have needs that you want God to hear, we want to agree in prayer with you. God's called us to be an intercessory church, and we're doing that. If you need prayer, please contact our church office. We take prayer very seriously here, and we'll take yours, your request to the throne so that you can be touched by the Lord. Know that God is with you. Know that God is for you. I know life is hard. I'm living the same world that you do. But I know my God is able, and that gives me that peace I need. Perhaps you're overwhelmed today. I sense that by the Spirit. You don't know if God's really going to come through for you. God is faithful, and God is there for you, and he's a very present help in time of trouble. Put your full heart, your full attention on the Lord. Call on him, and he will answer you, and he will deliver you, because whoever calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Lord, I pray for those that are watching that are overwhelmed. I ask you, Lord, to strengthen them with might and inner man through your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your fullness, and let your joy, the joy of the Lord, come up inside of them through the Spirit of God, and let that joy take them through this to the point that they overcome it. And through Christ, receive restoration in their lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. God is so faithful. He's so good. We'd love to hear from you how God has touched you through this ministry, through the word that comes forth, through the prayers. Let us know what God's doing in your life. And then finally, if you have been watching Keep the Kingdom Living, you know our integrity, you know everything I preach is out of God's word, backed up from the word. And you'd like to take that next step. We've been asking God to give us covenant partners. Will you become one? Stand with us. Hold our arms up in prayer. Support the ministry financially so that we can continue going to the nations of the world as we have been for so many years. We're so grateful to God for that opportunity. If you'd like to become a partner, go to our website. Check out everything we're about right there at whcnorth.org. You can give safely and securely. Everything that you give to the television ministry goes right back into it. God is on the throne. Let him be the, on the throne of your heart and let him lead you into green pastures and lead you by still waters because he is our good shepherd. God bless you.